questions remain around the status of some regional banks. PacWest is in the crosshairs again today, falling more than 20 percent after the firm said deposits dropped 9.5 percent last week. And you can see all the red regional bank names behind me. There's quite a few, three that are not. To put it in perspective, joining us now is Rohit Chopra, CFPB director and a board member of the FDIC Board of Directors. He is also a member of the Financial Stability Oversight Council. So great to have you here and on set with me. Appreciate it. Um, I do want to start with that vote this morning and, and this news. Um, you voted in favor of this special assessment fee that's going to go to the uh, more than 100 or roughly 113 largest banks. Uh, why and how is this going to work? Well, we took some emergency uh, actions in early March to stem the tide and impact of the failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Under normal circumstances, there wouldn't be much cost to the deposit insurance fund because those two banks were heavily dependent on big uninsured deposits. We wanted to safeguard the financial system, but it came at a cost, and the law allows us to assess that cost on those who benefited from it. And it was the biggest banks in the system that were dependent on uninsured deposits, and they will pay the bulk. The biggest banks on Wall Street got tons of new accounts and deposits mm -hmm. because many depositors saw that those banks would be safe. And that's who is going to pay for this special assessment. So uh, you focus on consumer protections within uh, the financial sector. Aren't you concerned that pushing additional costs onto those biggest banks to make up for this insurance hole is ultimately going to find its way back to consumers, whether it's through tighter, tighter lending standards or ultimately through higher fees? Well, really what we see is those largest banks, uh, the banking industry over the last two years made hundreds of billions of dollars in profit. This charge uh, is a small sum of that. Much of that went to executives and shareholders. So here's what we want to make sure of. Banks that are badly managed, when they fail, the shareholders need to be wiped out. Management is removed, just like they were at Signature Bank and Silicon Valley Bank. We, of course, took steps to protect the entire system and want to make sure that those banks that benefited are paying for it. This, there is more work to do to make sure something like this doesn't happen again. We need to undo some of the lax oversight and regulatory rollbacks. And we need to take a hard look at those banks that are heavily dependent on uninsured deposits. Consumers, need, they should know their deposits are safe. And for, I think, 99 percent of accounts in America, they are under that FDIC insurance limit. And they have, in the 90-year history of federal deposit insurance, they have not lost a penny. So in terms of some of the regulations from your standpoint that you would like to see manifest from this, what are they? Well, we need to make sure that shareholders have more skin in the game. We can't have a system where executives um, take big risks only to privatize the gains and socialize the losses. That means real capital standards. It also means that banks need to have enough cash on hand, enough liquidity. And there was changes made a few years ago that relaxed some of those standards for Big banks, not the very biggest. The assumption was these big banks that aren't the very largest can't cause harm to the economy. What we saw was a need for decisive action because they were about to fail. So we need to make sure that we regulate them appropriately to stop potential consequences to the whole economy. Yeah. I mean, you're also a voting member of FSOC, which is the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which is the council that oversees SIFIs and GSIBs and all of these banks that were deemed uh, through the great financial crisis too big to fail. So how do you ensure that those big banks don't get bigger and the competition among regionals and community banks and some of these smaller lenders uh, doesn't get wiped out in the process? Well, part of it is making sure that we are holding accountable and using the laws on the books to not allow the biggest banks to essentially feel like they can get free deposit, unlimited deposit insurance. We need to change and adjust some of our deposit insurance pricing. We need to make sure small banks, when they fail, they don't really cost much because they're easy to resolve. They don't lead to systemic risk. There's a long list of making sure that we don't have blow ups that can really uh, lead to broader contagion. Okay. 
I, I just hear all of this, and I just can't help but think that this is going to mean higher costs for consumers in one form or another at some point. Well, we need a competitive market where when there that, that risk is priced appropriately. And the truth is sometimes competition can lead to better prices for people. One of the things the CFPB is doing mm -hmm. is trying to make it easier for consumers to switch their accounts, to get better prices, to use their own personal financial data to shop and switch. So there's lots of things we can do, but I don't think we want a system where everyone is paying uh, for the costs of someone else's risk taking. Yeah, uh, agreed. So, so one more question on this, and then I do want to talk more about the personal financial data rights rulemaking, which is one of the reasons that you are in town. But we've seen what's playing out with PacWest as the most recent bank example. Is the contagion contained? You know, I don't want to comment. We don't comment on any individual institution. But mm -hmm. the way I think about it is the regulators always need to be prepared for any type of shock, for any type of issue that comes. The pandemic taught us. We obviously have a lot of people thinking about the debt ceiling and what would happen if there, if there was pain from that. So I take a view of let's always be prepared. Let's always make sure we take the appropriate actions and to really look at every moment on how things are moving. Okay, so let's talk about this personal financial data rights rulemaking. And you're unveiling an update on this. I guess walk me through what the problem is and what you're looking to change. Well, I think what we see is lots of different new firms, especially using new technologies, are trying to offer consumers, businesses, new products um, outside sometimes of the normal banking system. We also see banks wanting to compete more for people's business, but it's often so hard to switch your bank account. It can be a bureaucratic mess to refinance your loan. So what we're trying to do is create an open banking ecosystem. We've seen this being done in other jurisdictions around the world that make it simpler to switch. We think the benefits of that will really um, accrue to consumers in the, in the form of lower prices and, and better service. We got, we got to worry, though, about privacy and data security to make sure that when people's financial data is being given to new firms that it's not being abused or exploited. So that's what we're setting up, and we're hoping to accelerate already some good developments in the market. Yeah, finally, you mentioned debt ceiling. I think everybody's watching this closely right now. Um, implications for consumers, for the financial sector, if we were to see this get to the 11th hour or even, heaven forbid, we see some sort of technical default? Well, I think there's less attention sometimes to how it affects the individual family. Yes, there's some projections that it could lead to job losses, other turmoil, but we could also see some very quick increases in the rates to borrow on a credit card, on an auto loan, on a mortgage, and if that goes up steeply, that could be hundreds of dollars a month in extra payments for households, and that will have a real effect on people, especially those who live paycheck to paycheck.